And <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Nathan Mishy. I'm from Comcast out in Philadelphia. And I'm here today to tell you about one team's journey from engineering operations or ops to site reliability engineering. Um, I was lucky enough to join this team about three years ago. Um, but first, a little bit of background on myself. Um, before joining that team, I had 15 plus years in web application development for various startups, um, did stint in corporate IT, academic IT, I was at the UPenn before uh, I came over to Comcast. And this was really my first ops gig. Um, but, you know, so you might wonder, what did Comcast see in me? Well, over all those jobs that I'd had in the past, I'd always had sort of one foot in the ops world. I always enjoyed automating things. Um, I really enjoyed building developer tools. And um, I happened to be doing a lot of chef work right before I joined Comcast. And so I think what the manager of the team was looking for was a catalyst for change on that team. And um, he saw me as one way to help move that team forward. And so he brought me in as the first service delivery engineer on the team. Um, the, te the term SRE was just kind of starting to get out there. And so like they were trying to come up with their own take on that. And they came up with, with the term service delivery engineer. And so what I wanted to do to start off is kind of share a little bit of the transition that the team has gone through over the past uh, about three years. When I joined the team, the name of the team was Engineering Operations, or NGOPS. Um, and they were in the process of changing their moniker to kind of get away from that operations uh, uh, idea. But when I joined, they were a classical operations team of systems administrators uh, by title and trade. You know, These were hands-on Linux, Solaris, Unix sysadmins. Um, they had yet to become experts in automation or distributed systems. And they weren't really applying a lot of software engineering practices to the way that they worked. Um, they were also the primary on call for customer facing products and services that were developed by other software engineering teams within Comcast, and in some cases, even vendors. Um, our manager was trying to change that, and he had us uh, engineers from our team embedded on the various product verticals that we supported. But still, at the end of the day, 3, you know, 3 a.m., the pager goes off. We're the ones who got called not the folks who are writing the software, which was less than ideal. Uh, we were also highly involved in deployments. I mean, I'm sure you know all this. You all have been here at one point or another. But um, even automated deployments we were highly involved in, in that we had to go attend CCB meetings, get approval for a change window. When the time came to actually do that deployment, even if it was a, a software engineering team pushing a button in our CI CD system, we still had to be on a, a conference bridge waiting just in case something happened. Um, and so that took up a lot of our time. And finally, the thing that I noticed as I joined the team was there really was a limited understanding of the tools that we used um, for things like configuration management and automation. And we supported probably close to about 20 applications, and we were a team of eight. So we really didn't have deep knowledge of the systems we supported. Uh, we just didn't have the bandwidth to, to have that knowledge. And so um, that's how the team looked when I joined. Uh, as I mentioned, the manager of the team was really working hard to start a transition in the team. And then about six months after I started, he uh, left to go be an SRE at Google. Um, it was a great opportunity for him. Uh, and he would set us on a path towards this idea of SRE. Um, but he, um, at that point, I had the opportunity to take up the mantle, lead the team. And over the next two years, we transitioned to today, which is a team of, as much as I hate the word, you know, DevOps-focused um, SREs, really focused on automation and testing. Um, we're now secondary on call for most of the customer-facing products and services that we, uh, we manage. And of those, we write most of those now. Like, they're things that we develop um, for our customers rather than other software engineering teams. We're rarely uh, involved in other teams' deployments. We're involved in ours, and they're pretty automated at this point. But uh, I can't remember the last time one of the product engineering teams had me on a bridge when they were doing an employment, or one of my team members. And finally, during this entire transition over the last three years, we took that as an opportunity to retool and rethink about the tools we were using and actually evaluate and, and give real consideration to what we were doing. And as a result, we have a really deep understanding of the tools that we're using and the systems we support. 
Um, and so, you know, that's that's a great story. Uh, rainbows, unicorns, great fairy tale. So, you know, how did we get there, right? I'm sure that's why you're all here. Um, well, the TLDR is it took a lot of hard work. Um, and I don't have a secret magic formula that I can give to you to say this is how you can take a team of operation engineers and turn them into SREs. But what I can try to do today is um, walk through some of the things that we tried on our team and then worked for us, um, like leveraging organizational change to foster support for this transformation on our team, um, developing a clear vision for the team, cultivating the talent that we had on the team, because we had a lot of raw talent, we just needed to, to bring it out, um, recruiting new talent into the team, and then finally retaining that talent once we had a team that we were really proud of. So to start off, I'll talk about organizational change. And um, there was a lot happening when I joined Comcast. Uh, a few years prior to my being at Comcast, they launched X1. Um, and it's really hard to understate the impact that that had on the organization. Um, folks here who don't know what X1 is, it's our, our cable product, under the, uh, and it is phenomenal. Um, it is really a game changer for Comcast, the cable industry, and it really had Comcast take a step back and realize, you know what, we need to be doing more work like this where we're developing and um, our own products, our own technologies, and it really led our CTO to say, you know what, we really need to change how we work. We, we are not going to be a cable company anymore, not just to be another MSO. We're really going to differentiate ourselves and be a, a technology and product company. And that was huge. And with that sort of um, you know, statement or gauntlet thrown down by our upper management, um, we got a lot of middle management support out of that. Um, one example of this is my executive director at the time. He took that as, a, as an opportunity to what he, he would say, wreck how Comcast works. Um, he would go on to explain that what he meant by that was he really wanted to build an organization under him of engineers. Um, prior to that, we really kind of had a few silos. We had software engineering team, we had our QA team, and we had our ops team that I was on. Um, but shortly after I joined, he um, took this on and he worked with our QA team and working with their leadership. What he did is he worked to reclassify all of our QA testers and QA analysts as SDETs. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with that. It's a software development engineer and test. Um, comes out of, I think, Microsoft. But the idea there was he was kind of drawing a line in the sand and saying, hey, we're going to really start operating as engineers in everything that we do. And he happened to start in the QA org. Um, and you know, when you think about that, a lot of times you're thinking about automation and um, encoding and programming. Uh, but it's not necessarily always the case. And I think the QA example is a good example of that. So what happened with the QA team immediately after this sort of announcement was made that they're all going to be SDETs, they took the time to do a real study to see, OK, you want us to do more automation. Let's figure out where it makes sense and where it doesn't make sense. And again, that's just kind of applying those engineering principles to how they worked. So it wasn't all about automation, but it was all about you know, taking considered um, uh, approach to the way that you work, really an engineering-focused approach. Um, so a. Uh, Another area that I got a lot of help was uh, my senior manager. Um, so I mentioned about six months into my stint, uh, my predecessor announced that he was going to leave. Um, his title on paper was a manager of engineering operations. And my senior manager was a manager of software development and engineering. He had several other software engineering teams under his purview, but he also had this operations team. And he uh, suggested that as we were talking about succession and how I might take over the team and, and if I'd be a good fit and if I wanted to do it, that I should probably have the title of manager of software development and engineering, not of engineering operations. And again, that was just another way to sort of uh, um, you know, call that out, that we are going to be changing how we work. We're going to really work as software engineers and everything that we do. Um, 
Also, another really lucky thing that happened uh, with that senior manager is, as I mentioned, he had software engineering teams under his purview. Um, and he challenged those teams to really take back the pager, take ownership of their infrastructure. Um, and he didn't just say, you're going to go do it, and that was it. But he really challenged them to say, hey, this is how we're going to start working. You're going to work with the operations team. They're going to enable you. And he could really see both sides of that equation from where he sat really close to both of those uh, teams. And that was a huge win for us. Because had we had to go out and find another manager and convince them to change how they worked, you know, that would have been a much harder sell. Um, but we had a, a, a senior manager uh, right above two teams that needed to change on both sides of the equation. And he was really able to help us affect that change. Um, and so all this management support that flowed out of the change that was happening in the organization was, was a huge, huge win for us. Um, and I don't think in an organization the size of Comcast, we would have been as successful as we were had we not had that support. Um, because I'd been in some previous organizations, bigger organizations, where we, you know, there was some ground up grassroots sort of SRE and DevOps efforts, and they just kind of die on the vine if they don't have that top down support. So that was a big help for us. Um, so the next thing uh, that I'm going to focus on, um, no, no pun intended, is vision. Um, my, the predecessor uh, and the former manager of the team, he had a pretty strong vision for the team, uh, focused on standard, standardizing environments, metrics and monitoring, automation, a lot of the standard DevOpsy things. Um, but it was never really written down anywhere. Uh, it was kind of all over the place in bits and pieces and a lot of tribal knowledge. So one of the things that I did as I came in as a new leader on the team was I took it to the team. I said, we need to have a clear vision of what we want to do and how we want to work. And I asked the team to come up with that. And uh, this is what they came up with. Um, there was a lot going on, as I mentioned. And this was inspired by a lot of the work that we had to do uh, moving to the cloud. We were also not only in the process of changing how we worked, but where we worked. We were moving out of VMware data centers into a cloud environment. And so the team got together and came up with this list of sort of guiding principles. And each one of these really kind of um, highlights some of those key challenges we had on that first slide when I was talking about the transition. So infrastructure should be cheap. That really kind of drove at that expertise idea. In the past, we'd relied on um, you know, network engineering teams who had big uh, F5 load balancers and GSLB devices at their disposal. Um, we had storage teams who had SAN networks. Um, the infrastructure team who, who ran all the VMware stuff um, and provisioned the VMs for us. We were going to take back ownership of all that stuff. And so that meant we were going to have to up our game a little bit. Um, infrastructure should be immutable. Again, that's kind of bringing some of those software engineering principles of immutability into the way that we worked. Um, infrastructure should be easy, easily reproducible. Again, getting to that infrastructure as code idea. And infrastructure should be created via automated processes. Again, getting to automation, another core tenet of how we wanted to work. Automated processes should be verified by automated tests. Again, bringing in those software principles of test-driven development and test-driven infrastructure. And finally, uh, product teams should maintain their infrastructure. Uh, delegating some of that primary responsibility of operations to the software engineering teams, because we knew we just didn't have the size of our team, the resources to be the experts that we needed to be on all of those systems. So we were going to have to give back the pager to, to some of those teams um, for them to support them. And all of this, you know, the management support, the team vision, that, that was really the easy part, right? Um, then we came to the hard part, um, you know, people. And people are definitely the hardest part of this type of, of change. Um, like this picture here, you know, they're fuzzy. They, they you know, slant one way. Um, everybody works differently, and you have to figure them out. Um, and this was a real challenge, because um, we had real humans on the team. We had a team of, of uh, I think, seven engineers at that time. And we had to figure out how we could bring them up to, to be this new SRE thing that we were telling them we wanted them to be. And so. The way we went about that, um, a couple different things we did. Uh, one, we, we challenged them to grow in a nutshell. Um, you know, you, you hear about this a lot in so, sort of uh, military training exercises, how they set up these training exercises where they're 
they allow their recruits and their NCOs and their, their officers to fail and learn from it. Um, and that's what we wanted to do with this team is really set them up, give them space to grow, let them fail along the way and learn from it. And um, of course we supported them with training, mentoring, and I did my best to lead by example. Um, a little story about that. Um, so as I mentioned, when I came in, I felt like we didn't have a very good understanding of our configuration management system. So I thought, you know what? I'll fix this with code. I'm going to write a testing framework for our configuration management system, and I did. And that was great. We had a testing framework, but no one used it. Right? Nobody understood how it worked. Nobody really saw the value in testing. Um, and I realized you know, that was a really early learning experience for me that I hadn't involved the team in building that tool, so they didn't understand where I was coming from. Um, and I also hadn't given them room to fail with the tool, right? Like so, I don't know if folks, any folks in here are software engineers, um, but as you get started with test-driven development, I mean, for me, and I've heard this story from a few other folks, it doesn't really click until you have that aha moment where you're writing these tests and you're like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And then oh, that one day you write a test and you run in your test suite before you're about to push something to production and you catch a major bug that was going to cause a catastrophe in production. And then you're like, ah, yes, that's why I'm doing this. So I hadn't given my team the chance to do that. So I just took a step back um, and let them work with the tool, um, let them struggle a little bit. That's really what they needed to be able to learn. And uh, they failed a little bit along the way and they learned a lot along the way. At the end of the day, we all learned a whole lot about how our configuration management system worked. Um, so that was one way I tried to help you know, the team grow with one specific example. There were a lot of others where just giving them that space to learn. Um, but another thing that I tried to do, and my management team with me, is uh, leverage some of the internal development and networking opportunities that we had at Comcast. So uh, very early on, while my predecessor was still there and we were in transition, they were, they were going to launch this internal DevOps days. Does anybody know about DevOps days, been to a DevOps days event? It's kind of a self-organized conference. Um, we were going to run int one internal for Comcast, a day-long event in our Philly headquarters, bringing in people from all over the country to just kind of talk shop around DevOps. So my predecessor and I made sure that we were on the steering committee for that and made sure that our team had a speaking slot at that uh, initial event. And that really kind of forced them to go out there and start talking about what they were doing a little bit in a broader community. And I think that was just one way we kind of gave them a little nudge to say, hey, it's okay, go out there and try something new. Um, another thing that we leveraged were rotational programs. So Comcast has a lot of rotational programs that we can take advantage of, and one of them is a program that we call Summer of Code, where as a manager, I can request that an engineer join my team for a summer for about three months and work on a project. Um, and so my first summer as manager, I was like, I am going to take advantage of this. I'm going to use it for all it's worth. And so I put together a project. I was lucky enough my project got selected, but I was having a hard time recruiting or getting somebody to uh, um, fill the position. So I reached out to a very sharp front-end engineer that I knew that I'd worked with in some of my other rotations. And you might think, oh, that's a little crazy. This guy's, you know, he's a JavaScript expert, talks to JSConf, like very well-regarded front-end uh, web application developer. Why would I want him on the team? Well, it was really to bring some diversity to the team, and he did accept, and that was uh, a really, I think, a trans transformational experience for the team because um, he was one of these folks, like Julia said earlier, who knew how to ask questions. Uh, he did a great job at it, and he was also, you know, a well-regarded expert, but he wasn't afraid to stand up in our scrums and say, uh, "I don't get it, guys. Why are we doing it this way?" or can we do it this way, or do you understand? Do we understand what's going on here? Can you explain it to me? And so that, I thought, um, was a very transformational experience for the team because they saw, one, it was okay not to know everything and ask questions. Um, two, they kind of saw how to ask really good questions when they didn't know something. And three, it forced them to, um, to teach, right? And that's a, a big learning experience when you have to... to Think about how to explain something to someone else. So that was a, a really good um, experience for the team. And finally, we have this uh, idea of lab weeks, which are sort of our take on 10% time, where for three different weeks throughout the year, 
software engineers can put together teams to work on something that they may not work on day to day, um, but something that may help the company. And some of these things go on to be products. Some of them, um, you know, just die on the vine. But it's a, it's an ex it's an opportunity for folks to experiment. And uh, I noticed that my team was not participating in lab weeks, and so. I started to heavily encourage them. Um, I think part of it was that they felt like they couldn't step away from their operations role for a week. So, you know, it was just making sure that they were clear that, hey, we can't all go do lab week, but one or two of us can. We can figure out how to cover it, and you're you're fine. Go go try that stuff. And so, a few folks started taking advantage of lab weeks, um, and that gave them exposure to software engineers. Um, you know, basically these things where you form a little team of four or five individuals and try to launch something in a week. Um, so it was definitely a different experience for the team, and they were able to learn from that. Um, beyond just some of these, uh, you know, mentoring and rotational programs, I also took it on, on um, myself to work closely with HR to make sure that um, this transition was successful. And one of the ways we did this um, was in the same way that the QA team had rebranded themselves as the SDETs, we worked to rebrand our team as SREs. Um, so we worked with HR, um, got the new job title, worked with the team to come up with the new job description. I think that was a key point is we didn't go write this thing in the dark. We worked with the team and asked them, what, what do we need to have in this job description? It's going to really describe what we want to do and how we want to work. And, um, and, you know, we were open and honest with them. We told them, we don't expect that you're going to probably be able to do this job today. We're going to have to give you time to grow and learn. And, um, and the good thing is, the majority of the team flourished. Like they took it um, as a challenge, and they owned it, and they really flourished. And those folks, we worked hard with HR to make sure that they got promoted because they really took a risk on themselves. And and uh, I wanted to make sure that they were properly rewarded and made an example of for the rest of the team. The real hard part, though, was we had a few folks who struggled a little bit with this transition, right? Um, and so, you know, we're dealing with humans, um, and the thing that I think helped me there was just being open and honest with everybody. Um, didn't try to, you know, sugarcoat anything, um, but also was being sensitive to the, the position that these folks were being put in. And, and really just took a step back and asked them to consider, do they really want to be doing what we're going to be doing on this team? And a few of the folks decided, no, this isn't really the direction they wanted to go with their career. And they, we gave them time and helped them find other positions. Um, it took time, but they, uh, these two individuals moved on. I, I'm still in touch with them, so I think it worked out well for them. I don't think you know, we burned any bridges. And, was just a really delicate situation, and you don't want to be forcing these people out, but you want to be honest with them and, and set the expectation of this is where we want to be, this is where you are, do you want to move to that um, new role? Um, but again, I think it worked out well for everyone. It was definitely tough, definitely gave me some gray hairs, um, and so it's definitely something you got to think about as you're, as you're looking to change a team. Um, the next thing that we needed to do was look at how we were going to recruit new talent to the team. Um, with this, you, you know, I really wanted to keep an eye towards diversity um, and not just, you know, sex or um, gender or race, but um, also the skill set on the team because, again, we had pretty much a team of sysadmins and we really needed to shake that up a little bit. Um, and so... To do that, we first leaned on our networks, because um, the Philly tech community is is pretty small compared to like New York, where I worked for eight years, or San Francisco, where coming out here to this conference, I saw like multiple signs for ML on the freeway, and uh, my cab driver, when he found out I was coming to this conference, told me about how he was learning Ruby and Go. Um, <laughs> no, no kidding. Um, you know, you don't really get that in, in Philly, unfortunately. So ta talent's a little more scarce, so we had to dig a little deeper to figure out how we're going to get new folks on the team. Um, one of the ways we did that is, you know, um, we sponsored local Philly DevOps meetup. You know, 
space and pizza goes a long way to maintaining those types of relationships and making sure that you can communicate with your local community um, uh, and have an open dialogue with them about what you're doing and about your needs and, and, and uh, getting people from, the, from that uh, community. Um, also reached out to our personal networks. Uh, I was able to pull in one of my former co coworkers from UPenn, the guy who got me hooked on Chef. So again, he had a web application development background, um, but one foot in the ops world, so he was able to come in and, and kind of bring that skill to the team, which was nice. Um, and then we do things like, you know, full disclosure, we're a sponsor for SRECon, right? And I'm here trying to tell a little bit of the story of Comcast. So we do a lot of that um, locally and nationally to make sure people are aware that Comcast is doing really cool work and we're really interested in, in you. Um, Along the way, though, we also had to play a little bit of Moneyball. Um, anybody read Michael Lewis's book, Moneyball? Or see the horrible movie with Brad Pitt? Um, I did not see the movie. I read the book. But um, kind of the premise is, you know, Comcast's not a Google or Amazon or Netflix yet. We're working hard to get there. Um, and But sometimes it can be kind of hard to compete with those Yankees of the tech industry, right? And so we got to do our best to kind of scrap and scrape and find raw talent and, and be willing to develop that raw talent um, and let it go on to the Googles, the Amazons, and the next Netflixes once, um, once it's matured. Um, I see my recruiter shaking her head no, but it's, it's a hard <laughs> fact um, that we've had a lot of success with that, um, with the raw talent. Um, and, you know, we've unfortunately had folks leave for Google, for Amazon, and for other places. Um, but I probably would not change having those people on my team for the two years or so that they were on there because they were transformational to the team. Um, and so getting that raw talent, using it for what it's worth, um, and letting them go on when uh, they have better and bigger opportunities is something that, that if you're not a Google or Netflix, uh, Facebook, that you may want to consider as you're trying to bring talent into your teams. Um, worked out well for us on a couple of occasions. The other thing we did is we really um, reconsidered and reevaluated how we did interviews. Uh, we started to ask for code up front. Um, when I interviewed for Comcast, it was like a day-long affair. I think I interviewed with about 12 people, did multiple whiteboard sessions. It was grueling. It took a lot of time my time, it took a lot of the team's time, um, and we really just needed to get more efficient about how we got people in that we really wanted to talk to. And so we came up with what became called the DevOps Challenge. Again, I hate, I'm not a huge fan of that word, but it got that name and it stuck. And really, it was really simple. I wouldn't even call it a challenge, but it was, you know, we asked folks to spin up an Apache server on an IS provider using the configuration management of your choice configure SSL, serve this web page, and give us some automated tests. Um, you know, we really thought, because we tried this ourselves, if you know the tools, you can do that in about half hour max, right? So we didn't want it to be a huge lift for our, our um, candidates. Um, and we actually told our candidates, if it takes you more than two hours to do this, you're probably not a good fit for this position. And, uh, and we've been using that tool for the past two years to great effect, our last two hires completed that challenge, and it really helps us weed out the folks who just, unfortunately, some folks just don't get where we're trying to go with the whole infrastructure as code idea, um, and that really helps set that initial bar of what we're looking for. Um, so we've had a lot of success with that. Um, and so finally, I'm going to transition into um, retaining talent. So we've built this all-star team, you know, how do we, how do we keep them? even though some of them do go on. But uh, I go back to the rotational programs because I think that's a core strength that Comcast has and, and something that you should, um, can hopefully try to emulate within your organizations. Um, you know, I continue to, to uh, encourage folks to apply to Lab Week, and they really like that, and they've done that. I've, I haven't had as much success yet getting folks to apply for those bigger three-month um, uh, rotational programs. You know, I like to think that it's because they love what they're doing on the team so much that they, they don't want to leave for three months. Um, but, you know, 
being human, you know, I, I know it's rooted in, in fear. You know, that's a big commitment to go out and join another team for three months that you don't know, maybe on the other side of the country. Um, there's a lot of ways they can find out you don't know what you're talking about. So I'm still working on that, and I think the team's starting to warm up, up to that. But hopefully I'll get a few of my engineers out into other parts of the organization soon because uh, I know from having engineers in, we learn a lot. And I've continued to do that. Um, last summer I had two engineers join the team. Um, one was a mobile developer. One was a middleware engineer. They both brought very different perspectives to the team. Uh, and they really helped us understand the various challenges that these different teams have in delivering services and helped us uh, refine the tools that we are providing to these teams. And they also, um, you know, beyond just some of the technical skills that were, were exchanged, we really learned a lot of the soft skills um, because we were being forced to onboard folks at, at a continual pace. You know, sometimes if you if you have a team that's fairly static, get complacent. You know, Lou knows this, Roel knows that. Like, we don't need to document everything. Um, when, we, when we have a constant churn of folks in with these rotational programs, it really forced us to have better documentation because we don't want to repeat ourselves every time we have somebody come in. Um, it really helped us organize our work, and this was something we had struggled with for a long time. Um, because being an SRE organization, we do about 50% of interrupt-driven firefighting, typing, firefighting type of work and about 50% of planned work, give or take. And so we had struggled for a long time to figure out how to best organize that and make, make it clear how work was flowing for, through our organization. But through these rotational programs, we got ideas from folks on like, well, you know how I could probably visualize this or, or do this thing in JIRA so that I understand what's going on. And we actually came to a place that, that works well for us. And processes, right? There's no better way to find a gap in your process than to throw somebody new at it and then they get lost. So that's, been, uh, that's helped us really um, shore up our processes as well. And I think, you know, the biggest thing that's helped this team um, stay strong is this new way of working has given them a lot of space to grow and innovate. Um, again, one of our core tenants was to enable teams to take op uh, ownership of their operations. And so in that endeavor, we've launched a lot of shared services like service discovery, um, monitoring, remote logging, and things of this nature. And and that experience has given the team a lot of um, exposure to distributed systems, cloud computing, skills that are valuable within Comcast and without. And I think they see that when they, whenever you know, we all go look and see what's out there. And when they go out there and they see, hey, I have the skills that the Googles and the Netflixes are looking for, I think that you know, there's a sense of pride there and there's a, a sense of accomplishment in what they've done over the past three years. And along the way, we've become known throughout Comcast as a pretty high-performing team. We're kind of known as the subject matter experts on deploying immutable infrastructure on OpenStack. Um, we have teams coming to us to use our service discovery tools, even though we've never worked with these teams before. So I think the team gets a lot of satisfaction out of those uh, um, encounters as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I forgot to start my timer. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Is probably I probably blew through that, but <laughs> um, that's pretty much all I had um, to sum it up. Um, you know, I tried to sum up a few of the key points on this last slide. Um, while processes and technologies are important, um, they're really the easy part. If you notice, I never called out a technology or anything that we moved to because you can figure that out. You can go read up, you can do evaluations. That's really the easy part. People. That is the hard part. Um, and you really just have to give folks room to grow. Um, and you have to go into this knowing that some of them may not make it out the other side. But you have to give them um, the support they need along the way to help them get to where they're going to go next. Um, managerial support is crucial. Like This would not have been a success without the help of my immediate senior manager all the way up through our CTO. Um, just we couldn't have done it. Um, and then finally, to be successful, you need to figure out how you're going to cultivate your team, recruit, and retain um, talent. So that's all I had. Um, I'm more than willing to take questions. Yeah? Uh, 
uh, the question was how long is our, our rotational assignments? Um, the, the primary one that I've leveraged thus far is a three month rotation. So they call it summer of code and it's usually over the summer. And so teams get to go for three months and be embedded on and work with another team. Um, a lot of times folks uh, go across the country. So maybe you're out of Denver, you might come work in Philly for three months um, to get exposure to what's going on in Philly or vice versa. Or out, out to Silicon Valley, we have offices here. So um, yeah, but, it, but the one that I've used most is a three month rotational program. Also in the rotation aspect, um, in my company, the developers are hardcore Java developers. And the people that is doing the SRE job, they are doing much more Python. They come from much more a sysadmin background. Mm -hmm. They do have development skills, but there are no really hardcore developers with a lot of history. I wonder if you had the same scenario. How do you manage that on the rotations? Like, so the disparity in skills, in other words? Um, really, uh, what we did is we tried to be sponges for the, the engineers who came to our team. And um, a lot of times we found common languages to work in. So uh, we do a lot of work in Go, and so our team does. And so a lot of the folks coming to, to our team were looking for exposure to Go, so that had to work out for us. Um, uh, and also, I think, you know, these rotational programs I try to call out, it's a lot less about the technical skills and a lot more about some of the soft skills that you learn in these rotations. Um, and so we've been lucky that we've been able to find a common path where we all are trying to learn Go together. It's worked out well. Um, but um, I, uh, to be honest, I just haven't had a, a case where we've had to mesh like a Java developer with a Python developer and figure out how they work well together. Um, we've really come, come up with a common language that we feel like we could both be productive in and, and worked in it. Um, when setting up a, a, an SRE team for the first time, um, some managers get it, some don't. Uh, some look at it as an umbrella for their operation to shield the development team from the operational work that was being done by the operations team before. How, one of the things we've been trying to push is um, a very focused, targeted um, function, and that's what we're going to that's what we're going to focus on. But everyone keeps trying to slide yeah. other things under the umbrella. Yep. Do you have any advice on how to kind of get that boundary and enforce it um, while still getting their buy-in to give us their developers? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, again, I'll, I'll be honest here, I was really lucky in that I had a senior manager who had sort of both halves of the house there, and that really helped us. Um, but I think since we've had some in initial successes, um, other teams have been willing to take on more operational responsibilities. And I think the key thing is making sure that they see the benefit in it. Um, and for, for most of the development teams, the benefit has been velocity. They're, they're able to reduce code at a much, and, and ship products much, much faster under the new model than they were under the old. And so that's how we keep them from slipping stuff back into our um, operational wheelhouse. We're like, we can do that, but then you have to come to us. You have to open a ticket. We'll get to it when we can get to it. Um, and so when you make those arguments with teams, they're like, uh, OK, we can live with this and, and figure it out. Um, that's worked pretty well for us. With the rotational programs, one of the things that our management is cognizant of is asking the question of, how do we know this is working? What's the value we're getting from it? Have you run into that? And if so, how do you how do you demonstrate that it's worked out well? So for the particular rotations that we've been doing, it, um, I have to submit a project and have clear deliverables that we're, we're expected to deliver at the end of those three months. And so that's really, I think, how our management is gauging is like Nathan committed that they're going to get X, Y, and Z done. Did they get it done um, in that three-month rotation? So for us, to be able to submit a rotation, you have to have that plan and you have to have those deliverables documented. And so that's how we are, are managing that at Comcast. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, so the question was, what percentage of uh, the original team was able to develop the skills we needed for them to remain on the SRE team? Um, we started with eight individuals. Two of the folks went elsewhere. Um, and the, those six remain on the team, and we've backfilled a few more. So, um, yeah. So the, so the question was, have we considered um, hiring remote SREs to expand our um, talent pool? Uh, we definitely have, but we have a requirement to be on site. So we, we've flown folks in from elsewhere. Um, but um, Comcast, and Comcast has other offices. So there's potential, I think, for some teams, not my team yet, to have folks in various offices. Um, our team, though, all the product teams we supported are in our Philadelphia headquarters. We value being able to pair with those teams. Uh, and not that you can't pair remotely, but I don't think Comcast is just quite there yet in terms of, of having full, full-time full remote workforce. Follow up with that, how do you deal with the follow-up with um, Yeah, it's definitely a challenge for us. Um, so we have folks who are on call, and we don't have we're, we don't have teams in, like, say, India or elsewhere yet, our team. So um, luckily, on call for us, uh, when I first joined the team, it was a little rough. Um, you could be called several times a week if you're on call. Now I think we get paged probably twice a week about. Um, we've really just shored up our operations. But it, it was a challenge in that um, we had folks in Philly who were on call basically 24-7. Um, so that was definitely a challenge. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, how do I envision scaling this up? Um, well, uh, TBD. I'm just getting my head around what I just done. Um, I did just um, transition to another team. So full disclosure, I'm no longer on this team as of about three weeks ago. And I'm being tasked to do a very similar thing of building up another SRE team. So um, hopefully I can replicate the success, fingers crossed. Um, but that's, you know, that's not really scaling it to the entire organization just yet. So I also just like the term DevOps, and I'm interested on your thoughts. I think it's kind of a fraught buzzword, and there are yeah, yeah. misdirections. But could you speak to that? Oh, well, now it's DevSecOps, so we're all good. Um, yeah, uh, it's definitely a challenge because, uh, you know, I mentioned we had support from our CTO, and he would say DevOps, DevOps, DevOps. But what he was saying was probably not what I was hearing. Um, and so I think the thing that worked for us, though, is even though he may not have had a, a clear, and a, you know, hopefully he doesn't see this and, and read me out, but, you know, maybe he didn't have the exact vision of how that was going to play out, but he trusted the teams enough to, um, to implement what worked for them. Um, and, and again, part of that was setting up the vision for our team, um, how we wanted to work. No SRE team is going to be the same. No DevOps team is going to be the same. So I think part of it was our team owning that for, for us, figuring out how we want it to work, and then having the, tr the trust from the upper management to go and make that work for Comcast in their behalf. Um, it's definitely a challenge. You know, you talk to two, three, four people, there's four different ideas of what DevOps is. Um, so for us, it was about putting that vision together of what we saw it as, what we saw our SRE team, SRE team doing, and then executing on that.